okay, it's it's recording. So uh, let me give a, like one sentence intro for Justine. Justine, feel free to just like build off what I'm gonna say. But Justine is a product designer at Microsoft and Mind Up, and she graduated from UCLA uh, in 2021. Yeah, so with that, thank you so much, Justine, and uh, feel free to take it away. I'll be here to help in any way. Awesome so much. Thank you, Sabrina. Every, um, you guys can hear me okay? Is everything okay? Awesome. Yeah, uh, I will share my screen. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks for the, for the warm welcome. Okay, give me a second. I will. All right. And you guys can see this, okay? Yep. Okay, awesome. So yeah, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining. My name is Justine and this is a UX focused workshop today. And we're gonna primarily be focusing on how to create an interaction slash like task flow. Um, and basically how to implement this UX centered process in your project to kind of give you a leg up on your projects. And by the end of the workshop, you'll learn what UX is um, because I can't go into like interaction and task flows without kind of in understand, explaining the fundamentals and then how to implement the design process and then learn how to do that by creating something called um, in, an interaction slash task flow. And I'll be leading this workshop through a design exercise. Um, but this is catered towards like all audiences, whether you're a beginner or not. So, okay. And all. Oh. Thank you, Andre. Okay, I'm gonna go next. And so kind of a little bit about me, I know Sabrina kind of introduced me, but just kind of making it a little bit more personable and kind of introducing myself a little bit more. So I did graduate at UCLA just um, for, as a fourth year, just maybe like three, four weeks ago, um, Cog -Sci, um, Cognitive Science and Computing major. And I've been a product designer for about three years now. So I started off, Sorry, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, um, go Bruins. And then so I started off as a piano performance major at UCLA. It was actually kind of a crazy journey. You guys can feel free to ask me about it later. But aside from that, um, I've been, I actually, I've been, I've been giving workshops and talks um, at, at schools, clubs and stuff like that. So I love doing things like this because I actually started in product design with a really valuable experience because I had a mentor, so I've been trying to like give back to the community as much as I could. And yeah, I'm just really glad that Revive could have me this um, this year. And right now I'm a product designer on a remote meeting productivity startup um, called MindUp. And I'll be, feel free to check it out. It's free right now. And I'll be a full-time at Microsoft this summer. And some just like some fun facts about me <laughs> and brownie points, if you can re remember these at the end of my, workshop but I do love extreme sports I love skydiving like paragliding like jumping off stuff bouldering playing with death that type of stuff I love chicken nuggets um I think Spongebob is an anime everyone disagrees with me and I also have an extreme fear of strawberries and it's called Fergariophobia no one's heard of it and no one believes me but I've never had a strawberry before and I never will but yeah that was kind of me and so this is the kind of outline that I have for today and so we'll be, so I'll have um, Q and A after the live demo. I'll be jumping into Figma a little bit. So feel free to keep, to hold off your questions. Oh, okay. I think my screen, screen is still sharing. Okay. So feel free to ask the question. I'll, I'll give time a little bit at the end and then I'll leave up, leave some resources for sharing with you guys. So to start off um, kind of jumping into the intro because before I jump into Figma, I wanted to make sure that everyone's on the same kind of like level playing field um, and trying to like give you guys an understanding of what UX is. And honestly, even like anything you guys do, you should, um, it, it's really important to understand like why we do anything. And I think product design is a lot of the work relies on like why and the how instead of like what the tactical work really entails. So what is UX? To me, user ex UX or user experience is in a really holistic way is believing that there is a better way of doing things. And like sure, aesthetics, when you think of design, like aesthetics is what you think of, right? It's that, it's what like gives us that instantaneous moment of like delight and like joy. 
but when you think about design only in a very like visceral surface level it's kind of like like a one night stand um yeah okay <laughs> but to, to me this <laughs> sorry design really is the process of like making things better than what it was before and like holistic experiences like interactions it's not only about the um it's not only about what it looks like so ux and product design really is identifying the core pro core human problem diving deep into its roots exploring potential solutions try trying out different things brainstorming and then um, narrowing, narrowing that down, making decisions to find one solution or multiple solutions that works best to the ultimate goal, which goes back to the user. And I mean, it's like in the name itself, it is UX, not <laughs> me, X. I'm sorry, it is 7 a.m. right now. So please excuse my bad dad joke. But um, moving on, a designer's goal really is to solve human problems. And so for a to solving to solve problems for a real human being and even beyond a real human being to their to the person's community their world at large and really design is a collaborative effort usually you're not only the designer working on a team or on your project so checking in with your users critical thinking creative problem solving is the essence of ux design and so let's take an interaction flow so kind of like what the this workshop is about from my favorite example, Airbnb, like one of my favorite design forward companies, Airbnb. So let's say I've been in quarantine too long and I gotta go somewhere right now. And so the kind of like the task at hand is I want to book, I wanna book some Airbnb experience, but um, like it, like a, there's something called an Airbnb adventure. So I'll show you that, show you guys what that looks like in a sec. So I go browse on Airbnb and I happen to see something I've never seen before, this thing called Airbnb Adventures. So I don't know what that is, but I do tap into it to learn more. And that's like, oh, that's like really nice. It's like a multi-day um, multi trip kind of thing. It has a really cool looking picture and then you click into it. You're like interested because elephants are the coolest creatures of all, of, of all time. Um, fun fact, elephants, can like hug by putting their like trunks in each other's mouths <laughs> the more you know but okay after you click into like this elef elephants like adventure because that theme is really cool um you you kind of have this like instagram stories type looking interaction thing it looks like a normal phone like experience interaction thing so it's easy to navigate but kind of walking through this flow like why isn't every digital experience that's nice like what made this interaction flow good well first the home page had really clear categorization and then for an, an airbnb like newbie like me i had no idea what this meant so then descriptive visuals like here and like um the little text underneath helped me kind of give get context and then as i had more contextual information the picture thumbnails helped me decide this was kind of looked little bit like Pinterest, so it was kind of like picture forward. So that gave me kind of like an easy scrollable view of what this might have been. And then a familiar Instagram type story interaction gave me a broad but specific enough overview of ultimately made me what um, made me want to learn more about what what this Airbnb adventure was. So then moving on to this, this interaction flow isn't done yet. So it's like moving on. I'm convinced now that I want to do this like elephant bushwalk. So like I click into it, oh cool, the adventure comes with this whole itinerary. So I'm able to select specific things through the filter system here. And then finally I get to confirm. So kind of wrapping up this interaction flow, like what's kind of going on here. So at first I wasn't expecting an itinerary, but that's pretty nice because theoretic theoretically I probably haven't been to this area before. So the product designers behind Airbnb probably were predicting and, and anticipating what like I, any normal human probably wouldn't know about um, this area. So they anticipated a user need and then provided an itinerary. And then next, the flexibility allowed me to bring like my family. Um, there's like filter stuff. So it's probably not just me on this trip. So that, that like, it gave the user options. That's another good thing that this interaction flow provided me. And finally, um, I can review everything and understand clearly that like for example, right here, I have cancellation flexibility. 
then finally you confirm it. So these are the types of things going through UX and product designers' heads. We um, predict human needs before they realize they even need to help. So it's like an extra added um, delightful experience. So it's like UX designers are kind of like, like that best friend, like we, we got your back. So this is an example of a great UX um, flow. And also what about like on the, on the flip side, bad UX. So this is when we start noticing bad design. For Airbnb, usually when a UX design is like nicely made, you probably won't notice it. But let's say like Craigslist. I'm not hating on Craigslist. Like I like, I, I, I do like Craigslist. I do use it sometimes. But let's say like I want like motorcycle parts. I'll give you guys like five seconds to like kind of look through it. But it's not like that intuitive, right? Because everything's the same color. Um, this, I'm not really sure why they chose blue but it lacks hierarchy, it lacks structure, and there's <clears throat> just in general like information overwhelm. Um, and I can go on and on. I do love Kim's Convenience if anyone has watched this show before. But okay, if anyone's like interested, motorcycle parts were like right here under for sale. So <laughs> definitely wouldn't have known, but okay, let's move on. So I kind of hope, I, I kind of hope you guys I hope I convinced you guys why UX is important and is essential to any product because without it, you really have no users, no revenue and no valid, valid data backed product. So um, yeah, brands and products are sticky. Um, and if you have a great experience with any company or any product or any app, then you will most likely stick to it, which is our goal. So once again, to reiterate the three points, anticipate human needs, solve core problems and invest in good design um, are the three core tenets of like product design. Um, and yeah, you'll be a great asset to any, to any company if these are kind of like what you focus on rather than focusing on like visual design and like making, making designs and screens super clean with like drop shadows and um, like 3D stuff, but that's not like the foundation of like UX design. But now that we've covered the what and the why, let's focus on how. So how does this tie into the design thinking process? Because many people think that there's just this like one golden step-by-step -step design process that any, like all UX designers need. And if you just check all those boxes, check all those points, then you're good. And I really do see all this online, like medium articles and like eBooks, like the media loves to sensationalize, like there's only five clear steps to like um, UX design but it really like, it really isn't that easy. Like for example, let's take an example of, um, like let's say your first, ex um, your first job as a UX designer was like to design a backpack that doubles as a water bottle or something like that. Because U UX design isn't always digital experiences. It could be like, um, like product design kind of entails hardware stuff too, or just kind of like physical tangible products. Um, then you decide to like hop straight into the design software to kind of like kind of design like a mock-up or something like that. Um, but the problem with jumping straight into design is a lot of people aren't really asking questions um, about themselves. Like maybe like who's using this like cool, like weird transformers backpack anyways. And like, are there already existing, um, are there like competition outside right now? Are there any existing today? And like, how do people already use water bottles right now? You can't just go ahead and like design this like futuristic sci-fi backpack that doubles as a water bottle uh, straight away because like, like you can't have, people don't like change, right? So if you just like do this really cool thing right now, people might not adopt it. And then maybe like, if you add extra weight to the um, water, to the backpack, will that affect someone's experience and then yeah you're you're if you're not asking any of these questions then you're not really taking you're really designing a backpack for yourself not really for the end user so yeah design is hard it's really not only a job or a position but it's a way to like provoke change to make impact and it comes with a lot of responsibility um i'm not sure if you guys have watched the social dilemma on netflix um but You've probably seen news that social media apps are causing addiction right now, like unhealthy addiction, or maybe even something like, sorry, I'm gonna hydrate myself really quick. Okay. 
um, or you've seen like news articles about like how internet companies are stealing your data, you have, you've seen news like that. But in general, keeping these broader pictures in mind because you also, when you're designing digital experience, sometimes we forget that like user health is, is important. You can't just design an app like focused on like, you want them to keep coming. You want users to like um, use your app for like 24 seven, but that's not like really the point because you might like introduce like negative addiction, like mental health problems. Just be careful um, because like, just like how architects hold safety as our priority when they're building the bridges, the buildings and the bridges that we um, walk on and we live in um, and drive on like this is like they're taking that in mind so we as product designers also should be keeping that in mind so what we as UX designers what we have to do is to rather rather think in like big concepts not like steps so discovering and diving into the problem is number one I probably shouldn't have done it like one, two, three, let's do like ABC. Arbitrary, arbitrary um, numbers, but because they're not stepwise. But yeah, discovering the problem, discovering, diving into the problem, researching, understanding core, um, core roots of the problem, pain points, asking good questions. And um, tenant number like B is exploring like feasible solutions. And at this point in the um, stage of the process, you value quantity over quality. That's not something you hear often. That's again, quantity over quality, because you want to brainstorm as many solutions as you as you want, like like UX design exercises like crazy eights. Um, those ex exercises like that are great for actually um, get, garnering really innovative ideas when you're not thinking about visual, you're just thinking about like, how do we solve the problem and just like quick pencil mocks and stuff like that. So that's kind of where the fast and furious comes fast and furious part comes in and I'll kind of explain that a little bit later. And the third part is to translate every insight, everything you know into a design that works. And at this at this stage, like remain open-minded and implement feedback into your iterations because design really is never finished until somebody is using it. And no, not only your mom, but like really, really using it. And so this process looks like very linear, but it's not exactly. A lot of times you'll go through the process. Let's say you like already found a problem. You thought that was the right problem. You start to, um, you start designing solutions, but then you realize, but then you kind of explore, you found, you explore a solution that kind of like um, excavated a different problem. And you thought, oh, okay, that's actually a really big problem. And you kind of go back to like one where this is the problem focus. Kind of like research a little bit more. You start just you start um, designing mockups and like thinking about solutions again, and then you you move on to narrowing down your solution. But then you kind of like iterate, so you go back to. So it's kind of like this like um, cycle, never and end, never ending cycle of like designing. I'm sure you, some of you guys are designers, so you guys have probably um, had the experience of continuing to iterate and feedback. Oh my god, so um, frustrating, but. The design system in general is very, very iterative. So like embrace it. And so let's try it out with an example. So what is a task flow? So finally, we're gonna get there, but basically it's the actions and decisions a user attempts to take to satisfy a need or goal. So by tying in a person's actions and their context, um, creating a task flow al allows um, us product designers to better see the pathways a user may take to attempt to get at their goal. And al also it allows like your team, like your PM or your engineers, whoever you're working with to kind of like get a better idea of how your app will kind of, how the user will kind of experience the app without having to see like screens because like even if you're ordering food or something, you don't need a screen to get your point across. You can say like point A is, I walk outside and then number two, the next step is I open Google Maps to see where the nearest um, fast food place is. And then you navigate there as step three and then you order food step four and then um, you get your food and then you eat. So that's kind of like a whole task flow. That's a whole experience. And though that's the kind of task flow that I'm talking about. And in turn, it helps us as the designer to kind of anticipate user expectations and design interactions in a way that intuitively, intuitively 
goes with a user's mental model. So before we, um, before I show you a task flow, we'll have to pick a task. And let's say we're, this is a super simple one, but as you can see, it's not gonna be simple as I explain it. But let's say like we just want to add a song to a playlist and we're like UX designers on Spotify and our challenge is to just help users add a song, easy or so it may seem. But let's, before we get into it, we'll assume the user is logged in already. They have an account, they've already found a song they like, and there's some sort of like, add this song to a playlist button. Fun fact, the correct term is actually a signifier, not, but yeah, those just design, hashtag just design geek thing. But anyways, how hard can like adding a song to a playlist be? Okay, so this is very simple interaction flow. Um, step thing. And quick note about shapes, they start and end with little circles. Um, and you don't have to do that, but just, and um, a rectangle, a little rounded corner box is something called a process. Um, something is happening here. In this case, we're adding the song to a list. So essentially, um, yeah. So our goal currently is to initiate the task at hand, which is add a song to a playlist. But what's wrong with this? task flow because what if there's no existing playlist right now we don't have the option to create one so okay so we've added a shape it is um a diamond which is a decision point in in task flows and it's called a conditional meaning like it's now it's saying does a list exist conditional meaning that it's like an um if then type of statement so if there is a if there is a, an existing list then you add it to the list if there's not an existing list right now then you create a list. And so that, that's our second. So we, we've added something. Does that solve the problem? So we've currently detected whether a playlist exists. But what happens after you create the list? Right now, we're just going to end. So that doesn't make sense at all because we haven't added the song to a newly created playlist. So, OK. So we've added little bars inside this process box. Um, it's its own, so little lines like this means its own, like little module, module meaning create a list is it, it's an entirely different task flow. So I won't, I won't like dive into that, but basically um, now we've created a process, create a list is its own like whole thing. So you got to do that before you can add a song to a, to that playlist. And so moving on, so we've initiated the create, create list task flow. Okay, so what if we want to add the song to this list right now? And so moving on, so now um, that was really subtle, but basically what we added was this little arrow right here. So after you create a list, then you'll add it to the list. So, okay, the task flow is done, right? D done now, right? Well, not exactly, because what if I want to add another song to a different list? Um, because right now you say, does a list exist? Now a list exists because we've created one. Um, add to list end. But then the next time, does a list exist? Let's say you find a different song, but then um, it's like a completely different genre. And you, so does a list exist? Yes. But then you're like add to list. We only have one list right now, and that's not the list I want. So this is not a complete task flow. Um, and so we've added something else. Now we've added choose list. So the current goal is to be able to choose the list to add to. And so does a list exist? Yes, it, like multiple lists exist now. So we choose one um, and then you add to the list and end. So it seems like it's done, right? But what if you want to create another new playlist? Because right now you can only enter the create list, um, like module the event, if there if no list exists. So that, that's not what we want because we wanna always be able to be able to create a new playlist, right? So next, okay, uh, like even more complicated stuff. So you, so from choose list, so, so because a list exists already, because we've already created them like a while ago, um, does a list does a list exist? Yes. So now we're at the, the choose list stage, and then you we've added an arrow, so we can create, um, we can create a list here, and then, so you can always create a list. To make this task flow even better, you might want to also have a back arrow here because what if you made a mistake and you go into the create list process, but then you 
decide, oh, never mind, let's add it to an existing list. Um, so you might want to put another arrow here. But basically, yeah. Um, let's say you want to, you found another song, you want to create a new playlist for that song, and then you add it to the list and then end. So that was the, the goal was to have the option to create a new list anytime. But what if a user, let's say we're anticipating another need. What if a user accidentally duplicates a song in a list? So now the task list becomes even more complicated. And so what we added here was, <clears throat> is the song duplicate? This is another conditional right here, either yes or no. And you might be thinking like, that's actually pretty, like why, why wouldn't, wouldn't you as a user already know what songs are in which playlist? But even, okay, so our current goal is to anticipate a human need right now, but actually, not really, because this is one of my playlists and it is like 532 songs right here. And it's actually quite a bit. I'll admit that I do have bad memories. So I, it's actually happened to me multiple times where I've accidentally like duplicated a song and then the little modal like pop-up from Spotify comes up saying like, oh, this is your songs already in here. Do you want to add it in here anyway? Or just kind of like, never mind. So that's like a really nice, um, thing that Spotify UX designer is kind of anticipated that like human memory is kind of like really bad. So yeah, if anyone wants that playlist, I can share it later. <laughs> but anyways, kind of like, I hope you guys can see this kind, of, this kind of small, but basically is the song duplicate. If it is not, then add it to the list. But if it is yes, then you kind of notify the user that it's duplicate, just kind of make them aware. And then they have the option to add the song anyways, and then add to list or never mind, and then you end it. So exactly how Spotify works. So what else is missing? Actually, kind of a lot is missing, but this is that was a simplified version. We left out like error states, um, checks to see if the user is logged in, et cetera. But kind of the point I wanted to drive across is that designers just have to be very picky. We have to be anticipatory and we have to exceed users' expectations. So when they run into unexpected scenarios, then we as awesome designers or awesome engineers, we have already taken that into care and consideration like that best friend. And so um, to sum it up, thought out task flows are very important because of two things, because of understanding and communication. Just kind of like when you're in a relationship because if someone doesn't understand you, or someone doesn't like communicate with you, then like, you know, things are wrong and you should be running the other way. Um, so understanding complexity um, required, required to get user from the intent to the completion. It's a whole beast. Task flows are, um, and then how we kind of like, it's kind of intimidating to like get maybe like a challenge statement or a prompt or um, if you're starting an internship or a project, this is your, this is our challenge that we need to make. But, and then jumping into Figma can sometimes be very, very intimidating, like right away. So task flows are an easy medium to see the nuanced interactions. And it gives just a little bit more information than um, maybe just like a pen, pen and paper sketch or sometimes like a button on a wireframe. It's not that intuitive or explanatory either. So task flows are an easy way to kind of get that your message across. But like, don't spend too much time on this. It's not supposed to be pretty. Um, so it's just an, a, a way for you and your team, whoever's working on it to kind of see how the user journey will go. And so second consideration is communication because um, good projects require effective team collaboration between your designers, your engineers, your devs, your QAs, content writers, anyone. Um, essentially, you're kind of, I don't know if you guys have taken a CS course, but essentially task flows allow you to write pseudocode. Um, so this well thought out task flow can kind of like show your engineers and indicate that you've thought through the use cases, the edge cases, the error cases, because if you don't think about all these different like branches of things, then the engineers will be the ones dealing with them. So yeah. And now that, cool, sorry, we haven't even hopped into Figma yet, but now that we understand theory behind it, um, let's see it in practice. I will show you guys an example that I've made. And um, how, do I, how do I do this? Okay, I'll start off documenting my process in Notion and then I'll move to Figma so um, we can get into it. 
So let's, so what's our challenge then? Let's say, so the context is that we've been living in this pandemic for over a year and many of us are kind of stuck back at home, unable to experience like on-campus life. We don't have any parties, no physical club like picnics, no sporting events. Well, it's gotten better now. Go get the vaccine, but still like friends miss each other, right? And we, and even like making new friends, it's like even harder right now. So let's design an experience for friends to share virtual adventures together. Like whether it's like a bake off or like watching trashy television or virtual escape rooms. Let's, okay, I will share a different portion of my screen now. Give me a second. Okay, can you guys see this? Sabrina, yeah. am I good? Yes, you're good. Okay, awesome. Okay, so before we hop into Figma, let's like, you can do this in Figma too, but I just do this in Notion because I love Notion. Um, so let's like just kind of get the context again. So I'll just kind of run through this really, really quickly. Um, I can share this template with you guys later, but as a context, we've been in COVID for over a year. We're really sad. No one can make friends and no one can experience how to experience that serendipitous, like physical in-person um, bonding moments together. So our task is to design an experience for friends to share virtual adventures together. So you'll fill all this out, just kind of tie in the design process again before we design. So I won't spend too much time into this, but this is just before you do a task, well, you need to do all this. So like, why, why is it important for friends to share <clears throat> moments together because of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs for any of you AP psych people, if you know, um, basically to, to feel like a full human being, like we, we need to feel belonging. We need to feel community, social love, support is what we need at the core. You'll kind of feel business opportunities. What's the problem too, if that applies. And so we're designing in a product. We need to understand like who we're designing for, like who, who are we designing for? So, I mean, to be honest, this app or this product could be for anyone, but for the purposes of today, let's focus on the student niche, um, just to cater to the audience more. There's easier categorization. Um, you'll be able to figure that you'll fill this out as well. Extra context, user's motivation, meaning like, why would a friend, like, why would they want to get on like your product um, at all? Um, maybe it's because I want to keep up with my friends and I don't want to lose touch. I don't want to feel FOMO. I want to do something fun or productive together. So this is the um, part where you would be solution generating. So I've already kind of done it, but just to save time. But let's say like um, our goal at this stage is to choose a high impact, high effort solution. Um, oh, sorry. Wait. Sorry, that should be high impact, low effort. Low effort meaning like low F, um, the solution that we can design as a designer that has the highest impact. That means it generates the most meaningful experiences and it'll do the most for our users, but have the lowest efforts for like our product team, our designers, our um, engineers. So I've only done three, three um, solutions right now, but probably, a good number to reach for is honestly maybe like 20 or 30 sometimes just kind of like brainstorming yourself or with a with someone else on your team so maybe like recommending an activity um could be a feature that you can like um brainstorm so a little description based on you and your friends shared hobbies and interests the product or the app will give you three one to three choices to save and schedule for next time another another um, feature that might help um, go back to that problem of like friends want to share um, momentous, meaningful ex experiences together. We can have like an instant hangout, uh, instant hangout scheduler, or maybe the main feature should be sharing the activity to a friend, like you're the one doing it rather than the app recommending an activity to you. Um, and then at the end of your brainstormed like 20, 30 um, features that you think might be the most important, you got to prioritize. That's like that. Um, when you, when I talked about those three big concepts, that's the third tenet, which is narrowing like design insights and translating your, all your insights into one narrowed design decision. So I chose 
the, the product will recommend an activity to you. So we're gonna do a task flow based on this. Okay. Okay, well, we're not gonna do that right now, but task flow, you can, so for task flows, you can either list it out like this, but it's a little bit harder when you wanna do like branches and stuff. So then Figma is a good, a good um, product to help you do that. I am going to share my Figma screen now. All right, Sabrina, we're still good. You can see Figma. Yes. Okay, awesome. So I'll show you guys an example. This is, if you guys go into Figma community, Omnichart had a really cool um, template that you could use. So go ahead and like, you can feel free to hop in there and see for yourself. But let's say, okay. So this is the example that we're gonna be designing. I'll be doing it over here, but let's, so the activity is re recommending a, an activity for two users, two friends. And our goal as a product designer is to help friends share serendipitous moments by removing scheduling friction and encouraging face-to-face -face interactions. So, okay, let's say, so now we gotta think through it. I'm assuming we've already gotten our context and all our problems, user motivations and everything. So now we're gonna, okay, so let's kick the, did I? Okay, so let's kick it off and we drag it in. And our first step is, let's say we wanna start it out as like the app. So for the app to recommend two friends an activity. So let's say that, let's assume that you and your friend are already on this like app platform already and the our, our app app um, sends notification to let's say I'll, I'll just do a Emily's phone or something like that I'll just do that oh no awesome so that's like step one the app sends the notification to Emily's phone and what are they sending they're sending um kind of like giving you like, hey, we found this virtual escape room or something like that, that we think that you, Emily, or, and what other, what other name? I'll make up another name in a second, but let's say like you, Emily, and like Jamie to, to like share together. So what's next? Then you, you say, okay, I want to see what this activity is. So you open the app that we have this is and then you'll do an arrow please okay this is going to be very fast and like kind of sketchy so it's not going to be the like perfect but bear with me okay so you open the app and now like what do you see in the app now so we're the app is asking you hey we found this virtual escape room for you and jamie to um, do together, would you like to do it? So let's so let's get into that. Um, so you're gonna do another arrow. Okay, and then the app asks you, okay, view virtual escape room details. Oh, geez. I auto layout is great, but sometimes it's not not the best. But yeah, and then you view the escape room details, and you have to now as a user, you do have to decide whether you want to do the, do it or not. And so that's where that conditional comes in, where it's like a either yes or no question. So. You're gonna go into, what did I name it? Option, I think. Okay, so now we're gonna do like, um, accept the recommendation right here. And then either, it will be either like, yes, yes or no. And I think this, they have like a bunch of like arrows like this, so yeah, like you need to just do something like that. If the color you don't 
if you don't want the color, you can always come in here and change it to blue or something like that. Um, okay. Give me a second. Okay. So either like yes or no. And then if it's like, of course, if it's like, no, then maybe like you can do something, the, the app, you could end it right there or the app can suggest something else. Or if it's yes, then we will send a notification to Jamie. Okay, rather than designing this from scratch and to continue this over here, I'll just kind of show you my current example just to first time sake and for you guys to ask questions. So, so that's kind of a really simple task flow right here. And then, so after, let's say, sends a notification to Jamie, because we do want, we, we're not gonna say no, we do want this virtual escape room. Um, and let's see if Jamie wants to do it with us. And so now we're over here. So, okay, I'm gonna, My bad, really quick. So now Jamie opens the app. Jamie um, gets this whole entire flow again. He'll get the notification, he'll open the app, view the details. And then now Jamie has to make a decision whether he rejects or he suggests an alternative activity or he accepts. So these can be whole like task flows in and of itself. I just didn't do it, but let's see, let's say Jamie accepts. And then Jamie schedules a different time. So that might look, um, so that will be its own like task flow too. I just didn't do it here just for um, time purposes, but you'll schedule different time and you'll like accept and stuff like that. And so like 8 p.m. hits, then you open the app again, you have your virtual escape room together and then you end up on like a, another conditional. Do you want to continue these weekly recommendations, whether it's, and then you'll have a yes or a no, and then finish off the task flow there. The, yeah, the reason I didn't complete everything is I do want to share this template with you guys. And as a fun exercise, you guys can, um, you guys can finish it off yourself. Just, I just wanted to lay a good groundwork. So I will go back to my PowerPoint. Oh, give me a second. Awesome, so you guys can see this now. And yeah, um, Sabrina, I don't know if this is a good time to have this 40, oh my goodness, what time is it over there right now? So six, sorry, I'm in Taiwan right now. So that, <laughs> I'm trying to like count back the, the time difference, but it is six, five, four, 4 p.m., 4 p.m. right now. Is this a good time to do some Q and A? Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely we have. Okay. I wouldn't say we have like 14 ish minutes left. Um, so if anyone has questions, definitely feel free to put in the chat, unmute yourselves. Um, or like I said earlier, if you're not comfortable doing either one of those, you can private message me and I'll ask the question for you. Yeah. It also doesn't have to be design related if you guys don't want, but. Yes, Saraj, I will be providing a copy of this template. Um, Sabrina, you can just like email me or something if, if um, however you want me to provide the links or some, something like that. I can also provide this PowerPoint if you guys need. Yeah, I think um, I can definitely email you. If you also wanna put the link in the chat right now, I can just add it to the Notion website. And oh, sure. if you go to the, um, if you go to the Notion page for this workshop, it should be uh, available right after this workshop ends. Sure, sure. Let me let me do that right now, really quick. <laughs> I see that. I'm like, okay, I have to remember to do that now. <laughs> Hi, I actually have a question. Oh um, my God, Bianca! Hello. Hi, how's it going? 
Hello. Yeah, for all of you we, guys, fun fact, see... we, went to, we went to high school together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then I saw her, like, I see you everywhere, like, on my LinkedIn, on Instagram, and everywhere. <laughs> so I'm just like, oh, my God, Justine, she's making so many big moves. And I really like your workshop. Your jokes were, like, dude, I was muted, but, like, I, <laughs> I laughed at every single one of them, just so you know. But, yeah, anyways, um, yeah, I guess my question for you is, what are your favorite frameworks that you use to design? Because I know you mentioned, like, Crazy Eights um and there there are definitely a few other ones out there so yeah if you don't mind sharing yeah that is a great that is a great question actually um I think I'll other than like crazy eight space um for any of you guys who don't um know what crazy eight is let's you can do this in Figma or on, in paper and pencil but it's just kind of like a brainstorming exercise let's say you have like eight post-it notes and then we had the same like challenge, like design an experience for like friends to share together. And you have like, I forgot the time, but maybe 30 seconds on each eight, each post-it note to like draw up. Um, I don't want to say draw because draw is intimidating and I can't draw at all. So um, just like stick figure, um, like, like a solution or something like that. It can even be like text and just like eight, um, eight solutions. So it's like a quick and easy, easy, dirty way to kind of get ideas out without worrying too much about visuals. So aside from um, Crazy Eights, I I also really just love, I, I don't have like a, I love how Crazy Eights is like its own thing. And it's like easy to like, it's easy to kind of like explain it. Um, I also love like story storyboarding. If you got, if you have, because um, Crazy Eights is only like one off post-it notes like one one idea per post-it note um storyboarding is something I also like to do where it's a little bit more nuanced than a crazy eight thing um you still have the same problem challenge um but then instead of just one idea per post-it note let's say you ch you chose like a post-it note already and then you want to like kind of like hash it out a little bit more storyboarding is kind of exactly what it sounds like you kind of like make it a story and there's like maybe like three big three bigger um boxes that you would like draw like a mini journey and then kind of like narr narrate it on the bottom or something like that and it's kind of like a step a b and c um that's one and i also i, I do love just like post-it notes in general too like just like not even just not even sketches just text 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 descriptions of like maybe solutions that you might want to draw up amazing I, I love that <laughs> but yeah it kind of sounds like you're making a tiny comic for your actual uh, journey so that's really cool I think you've got another question in the chat oh yeah sure um thanks Bianca and Siraj asks is there a difference between a user flow and a task flow I know user flows are usually linked to personas but I don't know if you use the terms interchangeably I feel like in UX design there's just like so many different interchangeable terms or just like terms that confuse like the frick out of everyone there's like because even I use like task and interaction flow and then there's like UX design product design there's there's just too much experience design but um in my opinion in my opinion I don't I don't think um at least I use the terms interchangeably um because I know User flows are usually linked to personas. Yeah, yes, um, because you're like um, solidifying the context before you make the flow, you're um, understanding who you're designing for and you do a task flow on that. To me, there's a kind of, there's a difference between flows and like user journeys though. There's like another term called like user journeys where you kind of take into the account like users and emotions in there and it's, it, it looks like a little bit different. It's kind of like a chart, so. Um, I hope that answers your question. To me, I to sum up, I, I do use the terms interchangeably. And I think it's not like these are not technical terms that like an interviewer, if you're interviewing for like an internship or something, they're going to test you like, what is the difference? Or like, you have to use like this term or this term, like, as long as you have the idea like across, it's just a flow. And the, the purpose of doing a flow is to help a user get from point A to point B, then that's fine. Um, yeah. Okay. Bianca asks, what are my favorite plugins? Ooh, okay. Let me share my screen. I will 
I, I have a lot, but I do have a, a few that I, I, a few that I like. Um, let me think. So my plugins that I have is, I'm trying to think which one's like the one to, I do like content, content reel, content reel, Microsoft made it. And basically it's just, you know how usually sometimes when you design, sometimes you use like the lorem ipsum, like filler text or something like that, or you're kind of like copy pasting different people's pictures online to like put into your, um, your mock-up or something like that. Well, content reel kind of gives you like an easy, um, you don't have to like type it up yourself. They have already, they have full names. They have, um, they have dates. These are just like, it's just content that you might use in your app. So of course, like dates are very, um, if you're using, if you're making an agenda app or a scheduler app, you're probably gonna have dates. You don't wanna always type it up. You can use it like this. Um, avatars, I'll uh, let me see if I can like show you really quick. So let's say you are making a profile thing. Okay, you can like select all of them, highlight, plugins, content reel, and then you would go into avatars, random, apply all, and boom. If you wanna make it a little bit better, cause sometimes you like the stroke. Boom. Yeah. And like, uh, plus, I, I don't know, I don't know how I, I've, okay. But yeah, something like that, right? You can like easily, you can easily do um, like something like that. And also let me see another one that I, oh, Unsplash. Unsplash is also a nice one. It's also, Unsplash is also, you can like search up pictures and you can quickly, it's just like plugins are essentially just like helping you design it more efficiently. And you can like um, insert a bunch of things in here. There's another one called, um, Oh, mobile upload is also another one. I, whenever I run like maybe brainstorm sessions or if I draw something on paper and pencil, but I, and I want to quickly put that paper and pencil sketch into Figma, then you can like draw it. You can like scan the QR code. Um, the mobile upload will basically just ha have this QR code that you can like scan and then it'll like quickly um, put your picture onto Figma. And let me see. Ooh, Iconify. Iconify is one of my favorite ones too. You can, it's just a quick way to, let's say I want a calendar icon, calendar. And so they have a bunch of different like sets. My favorite is feather, feather icons. And so they'll have like a, they'll have a whole, um, you can search for icons and yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll move. I have, I have more, like, feel free to just reach out to me if you have like, if you wanna, if you wanna um, know more of my plugins, but I'll, I'll save those for now. Okay, what are the next one? Um, There's a question. What tools did, yeah. Oh, no, no, go ahead, but okay. Yeah. What tools do you use to make your presentation slides? They're amazing, they are. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, my, my slides are a little bit extra because of all the animations, but um, I only, I've only, I only used Microsoft PowerPoint for this slide. Um, if you guys kind of want to see how I did my animations, cause I know I did like, there was like a bunch of things like flying around and stuff. Um, let me, how do I do this? Okay, can I just, okay, let me kind of show you what I did. Okay, so, oh no, I'm not sharing anymore, am I? No, I'm not. No. Okay, let me open up. Okay, so let me see a slide that had like more, um, a better interaction. Okay, so maybe like something like this, like where I did this and then it goes up. Um, I, so basically what I did was, so you put these three images like that, 
And then on this one, it becomes like small, right? So you do, you just copy. So a trick, a trick you can do is just like copy. Oh, sorry. Like copy all these, like control C and then, oh my goodness, I hate, please. And then on the next slide, you just copy paste. So the reason you copy paste is because you copy paste and then you shrink it up and then you put it up here. And the reason you copy paste from the previous slide is because Microsoft will detect that you're copy, copying something copying something from the previous slide and then putting it here. So it'll automatically kind of like, it's, it's called this morph. And it'll automatically kind of like, did you, did you kind of see that like it goes up like weirdly um, because it detected from slide 32, 33 that we copy pasted. So it's gonna kind of morph it into the next, whatever it is, the next one. It kind of worked like Figma auto prototype. What is that, what is that prototype um, thing that Figma came out with that like everyone raved about? Um, I forgot. So it's called like auto oh auto auto animate auto animate yes it, it's exactly how that how that works so yeah I hope that helps <laughs> oh thank you you guys are so sweet and yeah maybe I can show you like I know we're almost done but maybe I'll show you like this one this one's uh, this one I'm like pretty proud of so like um if you kind of like let me see preview it kind of like kind of goes in all directions right um it like kind of morphs in this is um so how you kind of do this is maybe there's a better way to do it I kind of found a I, I just kind of created my own way but basically you copy again copy paste just like kind of do this control c and on the previous slide oh my god why is it loading again oh my god zoom so on here you copy paste it on the previous slide it's not copy pasting so you copy paste it here and then of course you don't want it to show up on this slide so what you're going to do is you're going to set all these opacities op um the transparency to zero over like I think here, right? Pick your transparency. You'll do them individual. You can't do them all at once, which is stupid. But um, but make sure you do it. You kind of like rotate it a little bit, make it a little bigger, rotate it. You kind of get the idea. So that's why you kind of like <sighs> like that, something like that. And then you make all these invisible, and then you morph it again over here. So you like animations transition transition morph and so do you kind of see it, it like came out from the sides so that's how you do it it's really fun so i'm gonna delete that and yes i'll post the okay let me post the note the notes in <laughs> thank you andre um yes bianca i will post the slides in here right now really quick before i forget oh yes yes and i'll put it in the notion okay Oh no, I don't think I can make it a, okay. Sabrina, if you can remind me really quick when I, I'll figure how, how to make this a cloud link. Um, so okay. it's like shareable rather than just a local download. But yeah, just like remind me. I sure, will. would you like me to like send you an email about this? Like, is that a good way to reach you? Yes, please. Yeah, Okay. yeah. Sounds good. And then I'll share the, um, the Figma link right now, just so I don't forget to. Okay, actually, while you do that, um, let me just start wrapping up since we are a few minutes over. Uh, but mostly, like, Justine, thank you so much for your time and uh, everything you shared it was so helpful and so like fun to like watch you do it. Um, there's a lot of thank you messages that have been filtering in. Um, so definitely take, like read those because um, it's very, what's the word? Like we all feel it, <laughs> you're amazing. But yeah, so thank you all so much for coming. Um, this is the last workshop we have for today and don't forget submissions are due uh, tomorrow.
afternoon-ish or early afternoon, like 12. So make sure to keep that in mind. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Justine, for sharing everything. And I'll send you that email. <laughs> okay. well, thank, you. thank you guys so much for coming. It, it always means a lot to me and I'm really grateful. Like, thank you, Sabrina, for like, help, like letting me um, talk here too. So yeah, yeah feel free you. to reach feel free to reach out and my contact information is on the last slide of the PowerPoint. So when I send that out, it will be there. Perfect. All right. Hope everyone has a good night. Thank you all. Bye. A thank good day you. for you, Justine. Bye. Oh, thank you. Bye.